Hey, y'all. Thanks very much for coming out here today. Uh, my name is Frank Coppersmith. I'm with Game Salad. Uh, what you're going to experience today is one of the very first looks at one of our uh, premier games we have coming out in uh, later this year, History Fighter. And I'm joined by the team of Headrush Games, uh, one of the great companies that we've been working with. But before we dive into all that, what I'd like to do is uh, let's go ahead and show you a great video about History Fighter. And uh, we're going to go ahead and cue that up right now. excited today to really give you that little bit of sneak peek of History Fighter. Uh, today we're gonna, I'm going to start with some, uh, some introductions. So I'm joined by a really great team. Uh, sitting right next to me is LaVon Lewis. LaVon is the director of Head Rush Games. He's got over 13 years of game industry experience and has shipped major titles such as Mortal Kombat, Silent Hill, and Assassin's Creed. Next to him is Jonathan Sam. Jonathan Sam's with me at Game Salad. He's a senior game engineer with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Texas, as well as a master's degree in computer science. He's also one of the very first employees we had at GameSound. In fact, he was, in fact, employee number one. Next to him is uh, Alex Brandon. Alex is a senior producer with uh, Headrush Games with over 20 years game experience. He's shipped major titles such as Unreal Tournament, Bejeweled, and Deuce X. Uh, he's also produced uh, games for Midway and one of the very first 3D games up on Facebook. And far at the end of the panel, we're joined by Garrett, Garrett Cathay. Uh, Garrett is a graduate of Southwestern University. Uh, he is a uh, competitive tournament uh, uh, collectible card game player. Uh, and uh, and uh, in many ways, is living the dream. This is his very first game industry job. So we're great, very excited to have Garrett join us up here on the panel. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, go ahead and get started. We're going to tell you a little bit about History Fighter. Uh, but we're also going to do a demo of it today in just a few minutes, show you how we made it. We're actually going to dive right into how we made it with Game Salad. Game Salad's a drag and drop visual tool for mobile game development, so you'll be able to see exactly how we built it. You'll even see us change it live in, uh, right here and actually see how those changes affect the gameplay. And then we'll wrap up with, uh, by asking some, uh, letting you guys ask whatever questions you might have about the, uh, the History Fighter CCG. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, start off with uh, start off with Levon. Uh, Levon, tell us a little bit about how you got started with uh, with Headgrush Games and uh, how we came to be sitting here. Thank you, Frank, for that uh, warm and wonderful introduction. Um, I just want to say real quick. Uh, also, uh, we, there's a few of us up here, but also in the front row here is uh, Thomas Thompson. He's one of our writers slash designers on History Fighter as well. We just uh, I guess we ran out of chairs or something. <laughs> Um, also, uh, I don't do this sort of thing every day, so I really hope I don't screw up. And that said, uh, I'll tell you about uh, how I got started on this path. Uh, jumping ship from Ubisoft, which is where I held my last director role um, in Canada, actually. And uh, before that, I was on the West Coast in L.A. working with uh, Midway, where I met Alex. Um, basically, Headrush Games started out of a desire to make new types of digital experiences outside of the realm of grotesque and realistic violence. Like, that was kind of at the core of my decision after working on Silent Hill, Mortal Kombat, and Assassin's Creed brands, and a few other things. I wanted to make some games that challenged thinking a little bit, or that challenged people's thinking about games, and what types of experiences you could have outside of first-person shooters, action-adventure, you know, uh, battle games and things like this. Um, 
I wanted to make a more meaningful type of digital game experience that hardcore gamers could respect, but that parents and educators could still get behind. And I was very excited about uh, all the new platforms that basically allowed us to keep all kinds of gaming devices with us all the time. And since that wasn't really something that my employers were going into at the time that I was thinking about you know, you know, getting excited by this, I decided to break away and see if I could do it on my own and go the indie route, as they say. So I did last year, and that's how Head Rush Games was born. So you said some good things about uh, about moving away from just uh, just kind of graphic violence and some kind of your traditional fantasy things. So how did that influence the design of the History Fighter CCG? Well, for one thing, uh, you know, we, we prototyped a lot of ideas early on in Head Rush Games, and you can ask uh, Garrett or Alex, you know, we, we, uh, we have a, a half dozen game prototypes at various stages using different technology, and we'd get a little, you know, we'd get a few steps down one path and realize, okay, this is a great idea, but we're going to need 50 people to work on this thing in any kind of decent timeline. Or this is a great idea, but none of us really understand that component of the tech yet, and it's going to be a real challenge. And what other kind, you know, we wanted to simplify things and decide on a game that we could make. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the resources we had, small team, not a lot of money, big ideas, really excited about some of the games that we already played. Uh, Garrett and Thomas and I met because they were neighbors, literally living across the street. And through being neighbors, we discovered a common joy and love of, of games of all type. And these guys were hardcore magic players with a big giant table full of stacks and stacks of magic cards. So. Uh, I'd always been really curious about magic and never really had time to play it myself. Played lots of other things and you'll find like if there's any anybody here want to be a game designer or developer or starting down that path, you'll find as your career grows that you'll start to schedule time in your personal life to play more games so that you can be better at your job, which is really cool. Like if you told me at 10 years old that that's what I would be doing later, I would have thought that was pretty cool and it is. Um, but with that also comes like you don't have time to play everything and so it's like I walk into the game store and feel like I want to curse the game store for not having enough time to play everything in the store. So Levon, tell us just a little bit about History Fighter, so, about the, the gameplay itself and about kind of the... the so we wanted, to make, we wanted to make a simple experience that was similar to the fun we were having with Magic and Pokemon games playing together, but as a newcomer to the genre, I, I had it in mind that, you know, it would be a lot more exciting for me to learn these rules and to learn this game if I knew the characters already, if it was something I related to a little more immediately. Like, if it were, say, historical figures that had statistics that you could battle with. And that's literally how the idea was born. Um, we were sitting around, playing Magic, had that idea, and decided we'd explore it. Um, it a CCG seemed like a good choice for us to, to make a game, to make our first game to the finish. Uh, because of the nature of a card game, you're dealing with far fewer animations, far fewer visual effects, and far more focus on the cards themselves. So this simplified things for us, and we knew that going in. So obviously you just talked about lots of art, lots of work to get the cards built. We've been banging on this game, I guess, for the last six months or so. Yeah. So um, I'd like to direct this next one to Alex. You're the senior producer on this title. Uh, yeah. But help and tell us a little bit about that, about the asset pipeline and what, what you've been doing as senior producer and what's been taken to, to get this game built and delivered. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I had met Levon a couple of years ago, and uh, we decided to join forces on a number of different ventures. And this one essentially provided uh, provided the means to create exactly what Levon was talking about. But really, the I, I guess the trick is, is that there's a big difference between the kind of production that takes place at a big company and, and one that that happens at a small company. So we've engaged interns along the way from various institutions such as Art Institute. Uh, we've had experiences with other folks such as uh, Garrett and, uh, and Thomas working, uh, you know, work people uh, that are either in college or fresh out of college that have a huge amount of passion and huge amount of talent. Um, and we also, in that, we combine that with our uh, senior skills at having been in the industry for a while. So really the way that we looked at getting resources was looking at people that had you know, the, the actual players of these CCGs, the ones that actually really know them well, and they can give us the, the kind of feedback that we need to be able to essentially hone a direction. And I think one of the biggest influences in that was just was hooking up with Game Salad. I mean, Game Salad is definitely uh, a fantastic resource for us, not just as an engine, but as, you know, in terms of getting assets and resources and being able to have it all come together. So I'd say that relationship is awesome, and it's a it's a big plus for us. You know, Alex, you had a chance to work with a number of interns and folks from, like, the uh, the Art Institute. Um, a lot of folks here are probably going to go pursue those types of degrees and, and go uh, go to those types of schools. You want to comment, uh, either you or Levon, comment on your experience uh, with the interns? 
I'll, I'll start and uh, pass it over to Levon. I sure. think that, yeah, I think that the, um, we had interesting experiences with interns on both sides. On our side, we learned really fast that if you run an internship program, be prepared to put a lot more time than you think it's going to take. What that means is you don't just give somebody a task and then expect that it's going to be done exactly the way you want. Not that That's very naive, but at the same time, it happens. And so, um, so with, uh, and another thing that you want to be able to do is to ha encourage people to step outside their comfort zones. In schools, however the schools work, depending on the institution, they can guide people towards what it is that they're interested in and have them hone their focus, but it may not necessarily be the way that the industry is going or what the particular job that they're looking for wants. So having that kind of flexibility is important. We learned a lot from the students that we got as to what they preferred versus what we preferred, how to make all that work, and I think you know we came out of it with some good experiences there. But Levon has a particular tale uh, if we have a little bit of time uh, as to uh, an incredibly successful internship experience. I'll, I'll try to keep that tale short, which I'm not good at doing. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, we have had some incredible experiences. I mean, first of all, part of the vision for the company for Headrush Games is combining the tried and true with the newest and new and having a mix of guys like Alex and myself uh, who you know are 10 plus years making games and uh, being very aware of the fact that we want to mix it up with ripe, fresh, new ideas and talent, you know, s straight off the farm, so to speak. We, we go farm to table with our talent and uh, try to make sure that we uh, infuse as much new energy as possible and fresh energy as possible uh, into what we're doing so that we're not just thinking of things from the point of view of us older guys who have been doing this 10 years already, but that we're making sure that we infuse that that unbridled energy of working with, uh, you know, some guys and girls that are younger than us. Um, so that's a big part of it. And in doing that, you know, like Alex mentioned, we've made bridges to Art Institute and a few other places. And uh, then we get uh, emails every week from um, individuals who uh, are looking for intern work or a, f a foot into the door of the industry, you know, some experience, uh, you know, some adv career advice, all of the above. And we're pretty open about that sort of thing, you know, at least like in, in my experience, there was always a mentor there, somebody older, more experienced that was happy to take a few minutes and show me something or tell me something that helped me to advance my career and to learn more about what I do and how to do it better, uh, faster, more e effective, more efficient. And so we try to be that. Um, the uh, world's fastest internship is the story I think Alex is talking about. So, okay, this guy calls me up. I'm going to say that his name is David. And so David calls up the company, and this is just a couple weeks ago, and says, I'm in town visiting family for the summer, and I'd like an internship so I can have some experience working on a game. Do you guys have anything that I can work on? And I said, well, uh, maybe. What, what do you do? Well, I'm an animator. I said, great. We've actually got something right now in the middle of our history fighter push. We're making a push on some animations for when these historical figures use their powers. There are animations for those powers and how they leave one card and strike another card. And we could use more of those. So would you be interested in trying one of those? Yes, absolutely. I'd love to do it. Great. So why don't uh, we try something for healing? I'll let you use your imagination. Just keep it green, some type of green healing energy that flies off of one card and comes down to heal another. So I need those two animations, one going up, one coming down. They need to be about a half a second each. And just as quickly as you can get those to us, we'll review it and tell you what we think and if we can use it. And we'll go from there. And there was some other you know, formalities, paperwork, uh, uh, you know, gag order, the whole, you know, the typical thing. And uh, within hours, there was a response from David. Uh, he had not only completed the work, and it was excellent, but he had supplied different ways to look at his work, including a video and then a step-by-step -step process thing of, of how he did what he did, and offered options of how he wanted those assets delivered, which was just extremely over-the-top dead on, bang on professional, especially for uh, a, a recent grad or an intern. So totally on point, totally delivered. It was usable content. I told him it was going straight in the game. And then he followed up with, but I've decided that I really want my summer off. I don't want to work this summer, so this is all I'm going to do for you guys. So that was like front to finish about a six-hour internship process and probably the best content that we got from an intern this year.
And and you know, and it's it's funny about hearing hearing this story is because it speaks very clearly to to you as, as students and those wanting to get into the industry. Uh, when you, you don't get many opportunities like that to just get a chance to maybe contribute all the animation to a great game like History Fighter, uh, when they come along, you know, you want to grab them and, and maybe maybe think about where your priorities are sometimes in the summer. Uh, with that said, I want to hear from some of the fresh new talent. We have some right here on the right here at the end. Uh, we've got Garrett. Garrett, I know that you've been a uh, competitive CCG tournament player uh, for uh, for Magic the Gathering. I mean, I'd love to hear some about what sets uh, what sets uh, sets History Fighter apart from like CCGs like Magic the Gathering or or other ones. Well, from a design perspective, um, something that we had to cope with when it, you know going digital. So you know, in, in games like Magic or in games like Pokemon, like it's something that you sit down for a good chunk of time. Like games, they they build up, very long process. Like we just we wanted to streamline the play style. We wanted to make it more accessible. Hence, like instead of going with you know dragons and knights and zombies and things like that, you know, actually we have some zombies. Never mind. Yeah, we ended up going with that in the end, didn't we? You know, we decided to go with the historical okay. figures. It's just something you can get into, and like the rules are fairly simple. Like anyone can understand this game, but we have still managed to make it a very high strategy game. We wanted like, a meaningful CCG while it's while still having a, a pick up and play kind of value to it. That you can you can pick it up easily, you can play it fast. You don't have to commit a lot of time to it to have fun, but there's still deep, meaningful mechanics. Most and, certainly. And and uh, Garrett, you want to tell us a little bit about one of those one of the favorite characters you were talking about earlier? Because I think it's a good example of kind of how how we had to modify the collectible con con the CCG format to to fit our style. Right. Uh, most certainly, one of the one of the characters I was most excited to design for this game was uh, Nikola Tesla. So, you know, he's a, historically a very marginalized person. You know, kind of always in the shadow of Thomas Edison, people like that. Um, and it was an interesting character too, because like. Tesla, he's a pretty shrimpy guy. He's not much of a fighter. Um, but in developing these characters, you know, historical figures over time have taken on almost like a, a superhuman aspect to them. So, like, each of our characters has a very unique power. Tesla's, for example, as soon as he hits the battlefield, just immediately death ray to the face, eight damage to the person across from him. Um, yeah, yeah I, I see a couple smiles. That makes me happy. Um, no, <laughs> And we like seeing those smiles because it yeah. means you get it. And, I, and I'll say this, I saw a lot of smiles when our, when our character art was being displayed. And that means that folks like Garrett and LaVon have really done their job in making it something that everyone can, everyone can really approach. We're trying to do the same thing with the, the abilities and powers. We're trying to make them relevant and iconic to the, uh, the people who we're representing here and transforming into these new heroes and villains. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure listening to us is a lot of fun, but I think it would be a lot more fun if we got the game going and let you see a first look at it here today. Uh, and we'll let LaVon and others talk through that game as we get it cranking. Jonathan, do you want to go ahead and call up our current version of History Fighter? And, and as always, this is a very, uh, I feel like I need to do an immediate warning, this is a very early build. So we'll see. Uh, I'll yes. See how it prototype. It is a prototype, <laughs> prototype build of, games, of it being a game sound creator. And while Jonathan, while Jonathan gets, that, gets that cranking up. Isn't that awesome looking? Yeah. We're working a little bit with this projector. It's uh, it's resolution and our resolution, not quite. And I'm gonna I'll try to mimic uh, what Dude. Jonathan is doing there here on my iPad Mini, so you can kind of see. LaVon, why don't you walk people through what they're seeing here on sure. the screen? I think that would be very helpful. So we just have, well, tell, them, tell them what we're, doing, what we're seeing right here. Okay, so basically uh, once you've tapped anywhere to begin, uh, part, of the, part of this game that sets it apart a little bit from uh, other CCGs is this mechanic we've got for choosing a sphere. Uh, your context here is you're an agent of the Time Defense League, and you are tasked with traveling through time, recruiting and managing these historical figures in an epic battle for good and evil between the Time Defense League and the Dark Forces of Order Incorporated, who are trying to use time travel to manipulate uh, timelines for financial gain. And you're trying to preserve natural history using these heroes. So you choose a mind, body, or spirit sphere, and this dictates your starting deck. Your starting deck is going to be aligned with historical figures who are more or less either, you know, tanks or casters or healers. So you want to go 
So let's uh, select uh, one there. So he's going to select mine, and we'll go to the mission screen. And missions are populated across a world map. Each one of these points on the map corresponds to a time portal. These time portals, go ahead and hit that one, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, these time portals, this is Stonehenge, uh, are places where the space-time continuum can be uh, used and disrupted and uh, accessed using uh, Tesla's uh, time zeppelin that you fly. And, uh, and you go on missions to do battle uh, with your decks. So here we are in basically the, the battle screen. Um, we've got uh, two players. This works as a pass and play live tabletop multiplayer game right now, and I think that's the style that we're playing right now. Uh, you can discard uh, to uh, increase your action points. Your action points are your casting costs, which you can see on the left side of the screen. There's action points and health points uh, of your opponent and yourself. Um, the main types of cards that you have are your fighters, which fighter cards can be either your historical figure heroes or minion cards. And minion cards, we've got everything in this game. We decided to load it up. We've got, you've got ninjas and samurais and lab techs and, and uh, zombies and uh, vampires and all kinds of fun stuff alongside the historical figures that control them. Uh, we've got your primary values, your casting cost up there in the right corner is four, your health is in the left corner is six, and then your attack and defense rating is uh, there on the bottom right. And Garrett, do you, do you want to speak to how how these mechanics uh, work since you were the one that basically drove uh, the decision to use these okay um, the uh, what would set this apart say from like magic I'm just going to use an analogy here um, those attack and defense values are very much in flux throughout the game um, we basically use them as starting values and most of the most of the historical figure characters have like bonuses buffs debuffs things like that so uh, we wanted to use values like that just so we could have like a it's a, a very we wanted we wanted a game that the you know not necessarily the rules of the game but the game changes with each card played. Right, it was, it was uh, well, it's a technique for building a higher strategy in the game. Um. So right now uh, you've got Socrates up there. You can uh, you can hit that flip button and that reveals the uh, abilities of the card and also uh, a brief biography. Now this is something that we're doing that uh, is our our fun and happy kind of educational uh, overlap here is if you don't know who any of these people are when you start playing the game you'll find out, you'll learn as you collect cards because we've included some historical info there on the back and uh, we're going to do some clever kind of blurring of fact and fiction there to keep it really entertaining. So these bios will often read as a few simple real life facts about this historical person and then the context of kind of who they are in the game and why they're important to your strategy or to either faction or if they're a loose cannon, it'll talk about that too. Um, so uh, that's something new that we're pretty excited about and that we think people will really have fun with. Um, and let's and uh, what you're seeing here is uh, there's the animations we talked about uh, like the intern, world's fastest intern made for healing and uh, I'm going to transition from talking about the game, go ahead Jonathan, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about Game Salad and why it, it's been cool to work in Game Salad to make this game. We basically you know, have a, a core team of less than five people working on this game and this game is already performing at a level that much larger games and larger teams uh, that have been required to make. Uh, we're, we're doing much more with less because of Game Salad's speed. And uh, a lot of that is in large part uh, due to Jonathan's efforts. He's the, the whiz under the hood. Uh, let, me but as in, let me just jump in there on something, too. And if, as, as a game designer, one of the major challenges you have is to find the fun. It's the idea, how quickly can I find the mechanic that I really like? Now, certainly when you're working in a collectible card game space, there are a lot of mechanics that everyone understands. We didn't want to deviate too far from that. But one of the neat things about Game Salad is that you can actually make your changes live inside the Game Salad tooling and actually see those changes reflected immediately in your game. And that, I, I think, substantially helps folks like Garrett and Levon really center the game around some yeah, mechanics. Yeah, and that's kind of where I was going with that, Frank. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, let's, look, let's take a look here. Like, for example, you've got Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, go ahead and hit fight, Jonathan. Yeah, he's shooting fire right now. Now, that's, a, that's actually uh, the wrong animation. So let's change that 
to Edgar Allan Poe's proper animation uh, live so that you guys can see what we're talking about. Um, so basically, Jonathan's going to go into uh, the uh, character table here and find the appropriate table where it has a list of all the different uh, animations, uh, all the different uh, characters, rather, and their, their stats, and including their signs and feedback, their animations, uh, you know, for that. And now we'll see the... Uh... Oh, we got to go all the way back in. Okay, so good thing you like the theme song. So let's get back in there. Hopefully we'll get a Poe right away. If not, we can burn cards till we do. So uh, a little bit more about History of Fighter. You'll see these objects like Jackson's Bugle. What we've done is not only do we have historical places and people, but things too. We've created these relics that uh, you might find Gandhi's glasses or Abraham Lincoln's top hat. And you can put these objects on, even on minion cards, and it gives them strong boosts or gives them abilities temporarily. Um, we've also got, uh, are we ready for Poe? Yep, go for ready. it. <laughs> so there you go, that's a little more appropriate animation. Um, so making changes is pretty fast. Uh, once you have your content in there, it's easy to start fine tuning it. Uh, let's look at that item uh, briefcase there, Jonathan. Can we uh, use an item? This is another part of uh, the game is uh, you're an agent, you've got a briefcase, in your briefcase you've got items and you can use those items like bombs and heals and, and various things that you pick up uh, as part of your gameplay strategy. So let's use that and we'll uh, target Poe and he took minus three. Um, and that's, uh, that's about where we're at with gameplay right now. You can play a full game to completion. We've got uh, about 80%, yeah, about 75-80% of the cards. Um, we've got uh, some final art for, and then we're still uh, working on a lot of the art for uh, minions and uh, working on art for items and relics, and really expanding that and trying to have lots of content for you guys at launch so that there are lots of cards to collect right away. And... Um, what else can I tell you about this build? You, you want you want to talk a little bit about why you because uh, obviously the design of History Fighter could could have applied to a variety of different types of games. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about why you chose uh, why you chose a collectible card game format? Well, uh, a lot of it was was resource driven. We're a small team working on our first game, and nobody's really come along and said, "You guys are brilliant. Here's a million dollars. Do what you want with your company and make whatever you want." So, since like you know, we're all working other jobs and and uh, doing this uh, from a place of passion and first steps toward building something together, um, we wanted to keep it simple. And again, a card game is uh, a very big genre. Lots of people play card games, so there's a pretty good sized uh, audience there for these types of games. We all like card games and played them with each other and decided it would be fun to make one. Uh, and it's something that was within our reach because if we wanted to make the next uh, Assassin's Creed, we would need several million dollars and 300 people. But to make History Fighter and to make a card game, we knew that we, uh, we, we literally started with a tabletop game first, made the cards on paper with index cards, played them until it was fun with dice and with, with index cards with each other, and then decided, yes, this is fun, this would be a fun digital game, let's figure out how to make it. And really quick show of hands, how many people out there either play now or have played a collectible trading card game? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really subtle answer yeah. to, uh, to why we picked a CCG. And I think, and hopefully the, and this is one of the things that got us excited to it, I, I first met the, the folks from Headrush about, I guess now it was October of 20, 2012, as GameSound was looking for some, uh, some great talent that we could help put some effort behind and, uh, and publish. And what really got my attention, because I, I built some CCGs with a company called Challenge Online Games, uh, games like Warstorm and, and Planetstorm, uh, games we'd shipped for Facebook uh, before our company was acquired by Zynga. Um, and I really got what really got my attention. Hopefully, is the same thing as getting you. This is a really exciting new kind of new look and feel for a CCG. Uh, you know, so many fancy CCGs out there, and, and many of them are excellent. Rage of Bahamut, others, just great stuff. Plenty of sci-fi stuff. Plenty of superhero stuff. This is just one we thought would be really exciting. And when I and when I had a chance to meet with Levon and Alex and really get it, get the pitch, it was just so compelling that this is something that 
that would be both, I think, that we could satisfy all the tropes of standard CCGs that you're used to, that I, that I, that I love, that you love, but at the same time, give you a little bit different experience, put something a little bit different in front of you. Is yeah, that right? absolutely. We were, we were very aware early on that we wanted this thing to have more of a comic book kind of look and feel to it than a lot of the digital CCGs that were out there, which are largely fantasy and uh, you know familiar genres. We wanted this to pop a little bit, and we knew that it would because we're rocking historical figures and transforming them into new superheroes and villains. So we knew right there we, we, we had something fun that we could play with and make pop in, you know, with a different art style and a different approach uh, to the humor, to the writing, and uh, you know, to the overall presentation. Do you want to show another, another change to the... To sure. How side? about this? Um, one, one thing that I really love about working in Game Salad is our ability to iterate uh, quickly, to rapidly cha make changes that are meaningful to our game and, you know, figure out how to balance the game and make it better fast. Um, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, when I worked on uh, large projects for Xbox, PlayStation level games, you know, making a change from the time you have the idea of, you know what would be cool? This and making that thing and putting it in might be an hour to two hours, you know? And if you wanted to test something, you're looking at a day or two to, to really collate all your feedback and figure it out and sort it out and fix it. With Game Salad on, uh, you know, simpler uh, mobile uh, casual games like, uh, like History, History Fighter, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're able to change things quickly. Like, uh, Jonathan, let's say we want to check out the uh, zombies and uh, run a whole deck of zombies against a different type of deck just to see what happens when a horde of zombies is unleashed if a player decides to ado adopt that as a style. Uh, we can test that pretty quick. Jonathan can go in and uh, tell the opponent, uh, the opponent deck to be all zombies and we can run that game and test it and see how it feels um, in a matter of uh, minutes instead of hours or days. Still like the theme song? Okay. Yes, but about the second year that you're building a game that you still continue to hear the theme song, you, you, dream, uh, you dream that theme song. Yeah, a year into it, you unplug the headphones. So here we are running all zombies and able to see, you know, what that does and what that brings. So uh, this helps us to balance the game because the same thing can be done with all Lincolns or all Guy Foxes or all, you know, Cleopatras. Uh, or we could run a sphere against a sphere and help to balance the game by checking to make sure that all the body cards are not overpowering the spirit cards or the mind cards. Garrett, do you want to speak to any of that in terms of uh, balancing statistics and, and the approach to uh, making a balanced uh, experience with all these different kinds of cards we're putting out there? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, as some backstory to that, so the, the three categories we have being body, spirit, and mind each have like their own general play style, like body as you can imagine, is high damage, high strength, high health, just not a lot of subtlety, just a lot of brute force. Whereas like the mind category is a little more based around like, you know, different status effects, confusing or like healing or things like that. And spirit, spirit's a little bit different. It's a it's kind of a fun little, little category. But uh, as far as balancing goes, like, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's kind of difficult. It's a lot of just like... Trial and error. Yeah, trial and error and brute force like playing one card against every other card you can think of with every other configuration of buffs and debuffs like it's something that takes a lot of time um, that's okay. that's where game salad really comes in handy because the iteration time like we're, none of us are none of us are programmers on this team on the core team of the history fighter brand and so you know without that programming back, uh, background to be able to rip open code and and do whatever we want a tool like game salad makes a lot of sense because we don't have to be that we don't have to be programmers to make our game it's very interesting when you think about think about that it's uh from a, from a more sophisticated game standpoint, you might call it the system design, all the details behind that make, a, that make up the game, the core game elements. But what's ex and it gets back to one of the nice things about Game Salad, that system design is something you often have to commit to way in advance, long before you have a playable version. And so you've already made a lot of, you know, put a lot of effort into designing a particular functionality or a particular feature, only to find out that once the engineers implement it, it either isn't much fun or it turns out to be way too hard to build or it ends up being confusing for your user. But the thing about Game Salad is you can make those changes kind of on the fly and then come back later and kind of build in the system after you've already realized that that, that particular game mechanic 
is an awful lot of fun and something you want to expose expose all your players to. So Alex, I'd like to get another get another question over to you. Now you've been using Game Salad now, working with Jonathan and others for a while. How does it? Tell me about how that how using Game Salad may have impacted uh, may impacted some of the some of the thinking on the production side. Because as a producer, obviously you're the one responsible for making sure all this gets delivered on time and working. So tell me a little bit about how how Game Salad's affected that. Well, it's, it essentially it goes along the lines of what's already been mentioned. But I just I'll just stress uh, that it's um, like. There's a, there's a number of engines that I've worked with in the past, the Unreal Engine, Unity Engine, uh, RenderWare. All of those have, like, like we've been talking about, all of those have an engineering component to them. And particularly since Levon and I started in the audio field uh, pr uh, primarily. And when you're dealing with a situation where whether you're a designer or whether you're an artist and you want to say, hey, I want to see this in the game, and you have to go through a programmer, that you know, it's a bottleneck. I and mean, whether it's frustrating or whether you have to wait, I mean, that's just that's just time that that's lost in the iteration f uh, factor, which is, as we've been saying, it's the critical factor in making a game fun. It's just being able to swap stuff out, being able to change table information, damage ratings, whatever, what what have you, and and be able to see what those effects are. So, Game Salad enables uh, that. Pretty much takes that away. It takes the engineering element out. I mean, uh, essentially, Jonathan's been fantastic because he knows the engine really well. But as you've seen, there's no actual code and recompiling so much going on. Everything's happening within a graphical user interface environment as opposed to Unity, which you have to learn scripting. It's a little bit faster than having to actually learn Visual C++ or any of those languages. But Game Salad takes it another step. So speed. Incredible. So I'd, I'd say that that I, you can't really, you know, there's there's really no value on that. I mean, it's, if there is, it's really high as far as you know your time and your money savings. So yeah, and that, that's that's a really interesting point, Alex, because uh, it, you mentioned Unity, and uh, that's you know originally, as you know, that's uh, that's where we started making History Fighter uh, in its first version, and it's uh, not that it's better or worse, but completely different animal from game salad because like you said there's a lot of scripting involved and there's a lot of uh you know challenges there that you don't see with game salad at the same time it's a uh, you know a 3d experience versus a 2d experience again not better or worse just different so we had to adapt some of our designs and change things that played better with game salad and uh new features that we weren't even thinking about were discovered that we could add to the game uh through the exploration of well what does this Tool do what does Game Salad do that uh, you know we're, that we haven't seen yet and that we you know we haven't hit uh, you know this uh, feature or this restriction this way or that way. So um, I know that Frank, you wanted to to talk a little bit about uh, you know some of the uh, the things that we did that uh, you know that were uh, adjustments made, I guess uh, from uh, you know through the use of the tool, new things we discovered or. Sure, we've got about we've got about twenty minutes left. I oh, definitely do you want to let the audience get some questions in. Cause why don't we go there? Because what because what we've got because what we've got up here on stage. I'm happy to talk about History Fighter as much as you want or Game Sound. Uh, but you've got experience, business, design, senior engineering, senior production, and entry level design. So I'd love to throw it open to uh, to any questions that anyone might have. If you don't, we're going to keep riffing on just uh, History Fighter and all the stuff that we've been doing. Uh, and there's probably some other cool stuff we can talk about it. But I'd love to just get your get your thoughts or respond to your questions. Yeah, either about game development or about History Fighter itself. I think there's a yeah. microphone there, right. and I guess everyone's going to line up behind it. Yep. Is, right. is how that goes. That'll work. Tick it off. Um, have you, I know you said you were going to release it on the iPad and the phone. Um, my question is, are you going to possibly release it on other platforms at, like, PC, Mac, yeah. or... Sure, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one. One of the neat things about Game Salad is if you use Game Salad, the Game Salad Creator tool or the Game Salad Engine, you're able to publish directly to, um, to, uh, to iOS devices, iPad, iPad Mini, uh, iPhone, to, uh, to Android devices, uh, including Kindle and, and Nook, uh, to Windows 8 Desktop, uh, Windows 8 App Store, to the Mac Desktop, uh, or to the web using our HTML5 solution. Uh, when the game is launched, and our target date is September, maybe early October of this year, uh, it's going to be a, a free-to-play game uh, launched on those launched on those platforms. We will probably start on iOS. Okay. And okay. as far as consoles and, and other things go, I mean, I think immediately you'll, you should look for us on Ouya, if nowhere else, yeah. as a first place that we grow. Yeah, the engine the engine does run on Ouya. Ouya. Yep. Um, from a production standpoint, um, what is it like working, being a producer for such a small team, when 
Um, it's not large enough that you you need a producer to keep the game going, the production. Well, um, it, it essentially there's so there's two there's there's several schools of thought. One of them is the creative side, which is people that say, okay, I'm doing this, I'm getting it done, this is really cool. There's also the side of how much money do we all have, how much time do we have, and what are our goals. Oftentimes, the two don't necessarily are always in sync. And so while admittedly, yeah, like Levon said, we have other things that we're doing. I'm running an audio production company at the same time doing a bunch of, you know, projects on uh, as far as that goes. But when I'm, part, you know, when we're all synced and part of the team, I always have to ask the questions along with the people at Game Salad. They've, they've got an internal producer as well. Matthew uh, uh, Linehouse is their internal producer. So, you know, keeping things on track and making sure that that things happen on a certain schedule is, is really critical there, even for a small team. Like, for example, uh, really, really quick, Into the Shadows, it's a very, very uh, old, old demo that was made by the people uh, that eventually became, uh, or actually, were, they were Triton, but they're now Starbreeze, and they worked on Syndicate by EA and everything. But when they were a tiny team, there was no producer there, and they were all creatives. They made the demo, and they were never able to finish the game. There was, it, it was all a bunch of artists and programmers working together, but there was no organization factor. So even, even with a small team, it's important to have that. But at the same time, like you're saying, there's not nearly as much in the way of crazy schedule wrangling and tasking and making sure that most of what we do is, is actually on Skype. And most recently, I was having a conversation with Levon where it was just like, hey, we've got this tool that we've been using to task people out. Do we really, really need the tool? The answer was actually, things are going really well. So it's really about like more or less like, okay, you know, money, time are the two biggest questions that just get asked periodically. And we, we, uh, we organize things according to that. But great question. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, from the trading card aspect of the uh, History Fighter game, uh, are you planning to release expansions? And if so, how are you going to balance that with like, like right now you have Goku Einstein. Hmm? How do you beat Goku Einstein? Well, sure, I can take that. Uh, yes, we will have expansions, and there's two ways that we're kind of doing that. One is through the main storyline, which is going to be an interactive comic-style uh, story of kind of what happens between your battle encounters. And as you, uh, you can get uh, episodes that will roll out, so there will be episodic story, and through the course of those episodes, new characters and situations and new portals and new places are, are uh, opened up and, and, and available to you and unlocked. Uh, the other way is through theme packs. So, like, we might do uh, an Old West pack that has a bunch of Old West historical figures. We might do a World War II pack. Uh, a, a plan right now is we definitely want to do right away a Femme Fatale pack and uh, have all, you know, female uh, heroes and villains uh, in that pack. And, uh, and so those are the two ways that we're going to roll out expansions is basically cam episodic campaigns that tell a story and that uh, unlock a series of uh, characters through playing through that story and as uh, theme packs. And, and I just want to touch on the balancing, uh, balancing part. Yeah. You know, I think it's uh, one of the things, it's our job as a, as a design team is to make sure that even when we introduce new expansions, we want to create new interesting play choices, but we, all, but we don't want to make all the cards that you already had obsolete or not useful. Um, so while there is, over long periods of time, always a little bit of stat creep, even in any CCG and pretty much any game, uh, at the same time, we're very cognizant of that, and we know that our job is to make the, make the next set of characters even more interesting and to have interesting interactions with the characters that we've already delivered. And I think that's really important because the goal is to always make the cards that you've, that you've acquired to have really interesting value. And one, one thing you asked specifically about Einstein, like this is totally something that's at the core of why we're making this game. Because along with the it would be cool to play a game where historical figures were battling against each other, it, it also goes down to that very root question of who do you think would win in a fight, <laughs> Einstein or Tesla? Let's find out. Like, that's what we wanted. We wanted to, to provide a way to find out. So for who would beat Einstein, I, I would definitely look for his counterpart in the other faction. I'll just put it that way. Thank you very much. Cool. Although it would be cool, I'm, I'm still waiting to, we, and we still might do this, for when Einstein goes Super Saiyan. I mean, <laughs> yes. How cool would that be? Yeah, that be um, <laughs> compared to the card play, would you say that there's a lot of um, storyline? Um, the core of the game is the card play. This is a, a g the game is the card play. The storyline is uh, is very fun. These are really fun characters to write new stories about. 
and uh, that's going to be a lot of the entertainment that happens. Um, the choices that you make in the interactive portions of the storyline will be fun, and they'll decide things like, you know, kind of which way you get somewhere. Do you go this way or do you go that way? Uh, but ultimately, the, the, the core of the game is card play, so that's where the focus is. But I do, I do want to add, I think the storyline that I've read so far is incredibly memorable. Um, I mean, I've seen lots of generic fantasy games of all types, CCGs and what lots with dragons and monsters and orcs, and you know, after a while they all just kind of blur and blend together. Uh, you know, you're not going to forget uh, Tesla's time zeppelin. You know, yeah, or if that's you... really cool. And well, and, uh, and from a writer's perspective, like Thomas and I right here, we have had so much fun writing this storyline. Like, there's so much one can do with so many memorable characters that you don't really have to introduce, and that you know, when you're playing with time travel, you can do anything you want. Yep. Mm -hmm. And besides, we have a Lich Rasputin. I mean, come on. Yeah. You, How can we, we not have a cool story? Yeah, we win. Thanks. Next question, please. Uh, first off, I'd like to say, awesome job, guys. Uh, I've been following for quite a while off Thank Facebook you. group and things mm -hmm. like that, so I was really excited when you guys said that you were going to be here. Um, and I've I've deal, dealt with the Unity side of it, and Game Salad on, honestly looks awesome. Um, one of the things that I did kind of have a little bit of a question on is it going to be more of a, a single player? So just won't say, for instance, one iPad and you're playing with your friend across the table, or are you guys looking into a deal where it's network-based yeah, type? Thing we will as well? have network multiplayer. Okay, Very and awesome. that, that's that's the plan there for sure. We we know we'll have multiplayer, same device to same device. But okay. we're anticipating having multiplayer across multiple devices. Okay. But that may not be what we launch with. It's very likely we'll start on entirely on iOS, mm -hmm. get all that locked down, get all that tech locked down, and then we'll and, and then and we'll branch expand elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Thank you. Guys. Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, that's a great question. Um, right now, the answer is no. Uh, we're actually building. One of the reasons we were so excited about History Fighter is it's helping push our tech over. You know, it's our helping. You know, we eat our own dog food by building History Fighter. Really helping us. You know, push us, push us to the limit. Uh, lots of new uh, functionality is going into Game Sound Creator, and the biggest piece that's going in that'll be available about September, October is the full-on multiplayer. Um, we, how we release that to our developer community, uh, we're still trying to trying to work through that because there's lots of. Uh, Lots of technical and, and, in some cases, some business challenges in sorting out multiplayer. So it's not there today, but it'll be widely available by the end of this year. Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to ask a little, not, not so much about the building of the game, but a little bit more about the business side of this. When, uh, when, when your, your game is complete, can you explain a little bit about how you actually publish it, how you're taking it to market? And it seems like Game Salad, which I interpreted to be uh, more of the tool you're using, is also somehow involved in bringing it to market. Yeah. Could, could you help us understand that a little bit? Yeah, I'm happy to explain. Um, well, it hasn't all been broadly announced. We're still kind of working on it. Game Salad is coming out with its own publishing brand called Ice Cap Games. Uh, we'll make broader announcements of that here in the next few weeks. Um, what we're going to be doing is partnering with some of our top developers to bring some of their best games to the market. Um, some of that is what we're doing here with uh, what we're doing here with the folks at Headrush, contributing some engineering support. But some of the really exciting things come around uh, some of the mechanics that we've built inside Game Salad that we're going to be introducing to our uh, making available to people who publish with us. Things that we call the game feature library. These are really important mechanics. Things like around monetization, like storefronts and virtual currencies. Things like retention mechanics related to, say, daily bonuses, progressive bonuses, other things that are fairly standard that you have to build if you're going to compete in a free-to-play environment on mobile. But if you let us publish your game, if you join with us as part of IceCap Games Publishing, that you'll get all that technology basically as part of that deal. The other piece to it as well is that we have a free version of Game Salad Creator. Anyone can download it. Anyone can publish a game using the free version. Uh, but we reserve advertising space in all the games built on our free platform. That gives us tens of millions of distribution impressions. And so then the combination of our publishing platform, distribution, plus a world-class game like History Fighter, we think is very exciting. And so this is really just kind of the first sneak peek and to just get some feedback about the History Fighter game. We're going to be talking a lot more about our Ice Cap Games publishing brand uh, in, in the coming weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say a little background story. 
I'm from middle of Iowa, or mm -hmm. northwest Iowa. And I got to say, in our small town, if you're gaming, it's, it's pretty low on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something I do after chores. That's right. I go feed the calves, and then if I have time in the middle of the night, hey, let's go jump on Halo, let's go jump on whatever we got. Uh, now, in that impact, if I went to my went to some of the family members around and said, "Hey, I'd really like to be getting get into gaming, get into programming, things like that," uh, there isn't a lot of opportunity where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So, you guys said you've been in the business ten years or something like that. Where were your foot, first steps? Did you grow up somewhere that was like, "Hey, this isn't really a type area," and you just jump somewhere else, or did you actually start at home and say, "This is where I want to start from"? Well, um, I'll go first, if that's okay. First, please. Um, for one thing, I'll just, you know, right away I'll say this. It's a different world today completely in the landscape of game development than 10 years ago plus when I was kicking my own door in. Um, back then, there were no game design degree plans at the university level anywhere to be found. Now they're in most community colleges. Um, so the landscape has changed. The technology uh, has evolved so that, you know, whereas 10 years ago there really wasn't anybody working from home or able to use easy to access, much less free tools to make their own games with their own teams, today you have choices of how you can do that. Um, today you can, sorry, you can program from uh, the middle of Iowa uh, on a laptop in, you know, from a uh, yeah, you know, from anywhere, and be part of a distributed team, uh, like some of the people on our team, and especially on the Head Rush side, some some of our other games that we're working on, we're working with developers in Atlanta, as far away as Liverpool, England, and uh, it, it just doesn't matter where you are as much anymore. So I want you to really think that, you know, going forward, if this is something that you want to do, uh, just get really good, for one thing, at whatever it is that you do. You're a programmer? No, I actually have minimal experience with okay, that. But it's though. something that you just you just kind of you've done it all your life. You gamed all your life and maybe I want to jump into this. Well, let's, Garrett, let's do you want to speak to this since this is your first game? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of itching to answer this question. Um, <laughs> so I I just graduated from college in December. Um, I went to a liberal arts school. I have a degree in English and I specialized in American poetry. Exactly. Yeah, I have no industry experience whatsoever. And now I make games. <laughs> and now, now I'm I'm sitting at my first panel with a game I helped design. Um, essentially, like the way the marketplace has been going, there are a lot of skills that they're they're great to have, and you should definitely start practicing them. But like, you can get into things like Game Salad with minimal knowledge and just start looking at tutorial videos. Like, you can build with just about anything. You can find as many free art assets online as you want. Like, all it takes is the drive to actually go out and do it. And, like, certainly, you know, I got kind of lucky, you know, like, living across the street from Levon and him just coming across the street noticing that I, I guess, was good with designing rule systems and things like that. And he just says, hey, you know, let's go make a video game. But as far as it goes, like, no, nah, it's, it's, it's mostly down to personal drive and, you know, just going out and trying to do it. Let me just make a shameless plug here. At 3.30 today, we are going to be, uh, Game Salad is going to be sponsoring a panel, which is breaking into the game industry using Game Salad. It's the idea of, hey, what's the, how do you get into the game industry? With a, the only way to get into the game industry is to make a game. And if, if you're not a software engineer, then the only fast, easy way to make a game is use, use a tool like GameSound. And so and we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the, the Austin market as a, as a hub for game development, because it's one of the top hubs in the world, and one of the top hubs, certainly one of the top three hubs in the U.S., as well as about the, a little bit about the tool and about, and about the game industry and about how all, of them, all the founders of GameSound uh, kind of got, got into the business. I was born in Houston, by the way, and I moved to Los Angeles and then to uh, Montreal, Canada, and then back again. So I, I can say this, if you're, if you're a game developer or aspiring to, to work on, on big console games at large companies and things like that, be prepared to move around a bit. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Any, uh, any other questions before we wrap up here as we're getting close to the, close to the end? Questions about History Fighter. Questions about historical figures. Don't ask me those. Um, yeah. Tar target release date is September. I mean, you know how that is. So we'll see. Awesome. Yeah, what's up?
right. The discussion, the discussion is ongoing on that one because, like I said, we, we want to do this a couple different ways and have a, a, you know, a few different ways that you can get to cards depending on your strategy and how you want to play. So that discussion is ongoing. You know, for sure we want to we want to roll out uh, packs that are themed and we want to roll out episodes that you can play through to unlock special mm -hmm. content. But uh, in as much as how many do you get for how much and that kind of thing. We're we're still talking about it, and and just to I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Ask your question. Well, what do you think about that? <laughs> oh, just getting getting feedback, you know. Mm-hmm. I personally like value of like quantity over quality. Like I don't want a trophy card like that because yeah. I'm not going to use super it, that get that gets right to the nature of, of why people play CCGs. Yeah. Some people play them because they want to build uh, you know, a really good deck. They're max min you know they want to maximize all their stats. They want great numbers, and that's the only reason they play. Some people play them because they like to collect the cards. Some people play them because they got their completists, and they want every single possible card that is a pos that's out there. And we want to strive to you know satisfy to satisfy everyone. We've got one more guy up with the mic. And I want to get this. So uh, from from the design perspective, you said you guys designed the the rule sets on paper first and doing the paper prototypes, and then before you brought it into Unity, and then and then the game salad. So. Um, did you try and keep the rules as simple as possible um, so that you could play it as a paper prototype first, or did you uh, keep in mind the fact that you were going to put it onto a digital system that you could number crunch a little bit more you know, later? That, that's, a, that's a really great question, and I'll tell you why. Because Garrett and I came at this kind of from uh, opposite sides of the river building a bridge where I said, I want this game to be so simple that someone who's never played a CCG before, it's an entry point, because these are familiar characters, they're going to get it right away, it's going to be fun before they get their first card, because of who you can collect. So let's make it a game that you can pick up and play right away, and maybe more people will start playing CCGs because of it. And Garrett came from the perspective inside of saying, well, we want this game to be meaningful for hardcore CCG players. So he's the, let's make it, I don't want to say complicated, but let's, let's make it robust and really full-featured and have really meaningful and familiar mechanics. And then me over here saying, but easy to learn, easy to play, quick, fast. I'm, I'm a sucker for, like, Complex rule sets, high learning curves, like high strategy, like stupid difficult stuff. So we, we had to compromise a lot. And I'm busy. I want to play in five minutes and be done. So, uh, you know, with, with coming from both of those perspectives and kind of making the bridge to the middle, we arrived at a rule set that we felt played really well as a tabletop game without going in too deep or being too difficult for any of our, no stat sheets. Any of our girlfriends or mothers or anybody else to understand and follow. And, uh, yeah, and uh, basically still having meaningful gameplay for hardcore CCG players to actually feel like it's something they want to play. Okay. Great. Thank you. All yeah. right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I want to thank everyone for coming out here tonight. Thank the, thank the panelists for taking their time to, uh, to join us today. Thanks so much. Let's give them, uh, let's give them a little applause for coming out.